Welcome to the Silberman Fellowship Ceremony and Distinguished Lecture. My name is Lian Shen. I'm the director of Anthony Foster Laboratory. And I would like to first to welcome everyone in the audience, as well as the many of you who are online for joining this special event. Yeah. And first, let me say a few words about Professor um, Silberman. Professor Silberman was the second director of St. Anthony Foster Laboratory. He resumed the directorship okay, in 1963, right after the death of the founding director, Professor Lawrence Straub. Okay. And then in the following decade, he put in significant effort leading the lab and to enhance its activities in research, education, in um, uh, engineering surface work, in all aspects of the lab. Okay. So he made a significant contributions to Santini Fossil Laboratory okay, and also to the general research and education. Yeah. So um, then okay, after his retirement, Professor Silberman's uh, former colleagues, friends, and families, they put together this uh, Silberman Fellowship okay, Award Fund. And this award was first given okay, in 2004. And it started around the time of his 90th, 90th birthday. Yeah. So ever since the award was given to wonderful several students okay, for their excellent performance, and uh, to recognize that. And so this year, okay, we have our new award recipient this year. Okay. So next, I'm going to invite uh, the student winner's advisor, Professor Adisha Abitash, to introduce the student. Yeah. So um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Ray Hone. Um, Ray Hane received her bachelor degree in 2015 from University of Tehran, uh, Iran, and then uh, her master's degree in civil engineering and water resources from the same university. University of Tehran is one of the best engineering schools in the country. So when applicants from University of Tehran or Sharif approach me, I just look at them very seriously. And I, when I interviewed her, I was convinced that she wants to do, to work hard and, uh, tackle complex problems. Uh, I am the recipient of the same award when I was a student here. Uh, there, is a, there is a story behind it. I was working so hard and I was wearing a big Minnesota pants that two, two, three people can fit in. And it was cold at the time, I remember. And my advisor just came into my office and saw that I'm not ready for the award ceremony. So she sent me home to change. Um, and be ready for it. So I, I quite remember that day when it happened. But in any case, uh, Rehan's research is uh, mostly related to passive microwave remote sensing of precipitation from space using uh, global precipitation measurement sap. So these days when we deal with flood and drought, it's not like 100 years ago that we put a bucket and uh, make measurements of, of rain to make decisions about our future. We measure hydrologic water cycle from a space on a global scale to be able to uh, assimilate this information into weather and hydrologic models to improve our forecast and better understand the climatic changes of hydrologic water cycle. And Rayhan's research is mostly related to remote sensing of precipitation in microwave bands and, um, and then using satellite data to make prediction in the next four hours um, every 30 minutes uh, that we that is often called now casting of precipitation but everything is on global scale so she has been doing a lot of neural network and big data analytics so without further ado Rehane, this is your floor please congratulations I'll do this. Okay, thank you, Ardashir, for your kind introduction. Uh, my today presentation is about deep learning architecture for passive microwave retrieval and now casting of precipitation. 
Oh, sorry. So precipitation is the crucial uh, component of water cycle and is the most important and active variable for uh, atmospheric water cycle for climates and weather uh, studies. In the last decades, with the uh, as climate change altered the spatiotemporal pattern of precipitation, we observed more frequent extreme events like floods and drought. Uh, <clears throat> studies shows that floods are the number one natural disasters in the US with the average cost of uh, 7 uh, $4.7 uh, billion dollar per, e per event. Followed by that, we have uh, drought as the second costliest natural disasters. According to NOAA, since, 2000, since uh, 1980, uh, US experienced 26 uh, severe drought, which caused uh, two, uh, around $250 billion. Uh, all these, uh, all these uh, extreme events are highly correlated to precipitation. So the need uh, for measuring precipitation accurately and reliably, uh, reliably remains a crucial task. Typi typically, precipitation is measured by gauge stations. Here at the, uh, on the figure at the right, I'm showing you the distribution of gauge stations, which are collected all over the globe and compiled by Global uh, Precipitation Climate Center, GPCC. As you mentioned, uh, gauge stations are not uh, uniform. We observe like high density uh, stations over the Europe and also United States, while they are blank space uh, in Africa, uh, Asia and high latitude and especially over the oceans where there are no uh, gauge stations. With that being said, satellite data can provide us a valuable data set by observing the Earth con uh, continually and uh, in a broad uh, spatial range. One of the most important uh, mission, satellite mission for measuring precipitation is Global Precipitation Measurement or GPM. GPM is a network of international satellites uh, that provide global observation of uh, a snow, a snowfall and rainfall. Uh, the concept uh, of the GPM uh, centers around using core observatory satellite as it's shown here uh, on this figure. And it uses both active and passive remote sensing uh, to measure precipitation by having a radar and a radiometer on board. So uh, active remote sensing involves using, a, uh, using radar and transmitting a signal to the object and then measuring the radiation that bounces off that object. Uh, while passive remote sensing only measure the upcoming radiation uh, like a camera without the flash. So radars in active remote sensing can uh, measure precipitation directly. But the problem with the radar data is that uh, they have limited spatial coverage. For example, in the case of core observatory satellite, which is shown, which is shown in that figure, uh, for in the um, gray area shows the footprint of the uh, radiometer, which use passive micro, passive remote sensing for capturing brightness temperature. The uh, footprint is around 900 kilometer, while in the uh, the radar footprint in uh, the blue areas uh, is around 200 kilometer. So we can see the special coverage of radar, which measure precipitation directly, is low compared to the uh, radiometer. Another satellite which measure precipitation using radar is CloudSat, which is shown in the figure at the bottom. You can see the special coverage of that satellite is also low. Now we want to see how we can use these two valuable data sets, the brightness temperature from passive uh, remote sensing and radiometer, and also the uh, precipitation capture by radar, radar in active remote sensing, and understand the relationship between these two, understand how brightness temperature is related to precipitation rates. So in that case, we will be able to retrieve precipitation in the areas that we do not have observed radar. And that's the first question of my research. So I want to, uh, I want to investigate 
if we are able to learn from coincidence of active and passive sensors to retrieve precipitation globally using brightness temperature captured by passive uh, remote sensing. Another use of satellites can be uh, weather forecasting. As I said, GPM has 16 different satellites orbiting around the globe. By combining and calibrating uh, the data from these satellites, uh, GPM provides global precipitation map, as it's shown in this video, every 30 minutes with the resolution of 0.1 degree. But the problem with this data set uh, and the limitations of it that limits its uh, applicability for using uh, weather forecasting is that uh, it has the lag time of around four hours. So it means uh, the latest available map is for four hours before. So we cannot use these data set directly for the uh, weather forecasting problems. So in the next part of my research, I want to understand if we are able to learn from the sequence of these valuable IMER data set and develop an algorithm to be able to forecast precipitation in near future. To investigate more about the first question that I proposed, I uh, collect the coincidences of uh, radar and radio, uh, radiometer data set and develop an algorithm that has two uh, uh, two steps. The first step is detection. So we feed the input, which are brightness temperature from radiometer and uh, physical atmospheric variables from model. We feed these inputs to the network for to the detection network. And the output of the detection network is either clear sky, rain, or snow. If we detect precipitation, we then feed the input to the estimation network. And the estimation network is able to uh, estimate rainfall or snowfall. After training the network uh, with the algorithm that I just proposed, I test the, uh, test the uh, algorithm by retrieving precipitation over a year. And the results were promising. So here, Diego CPR means use the network that used the CPR data, the radar data from CPR for training. Diego DPR means the network that use uh, radar data from DPR sensor. And ERA-5 is the reanalysis model. So we uh, assume that ERA-5 is the ground truth uh, for, uh, for our comparison. We, see, we can see that there is a great agreement between Diego DPR and ERA-5 in rainfall estimation. Uh, uh, also, there is an agreement between Diego CPR and reanalysis data. And to our knowledge, this is the like closest uh, a snowfall product to the, to the reanalysis data. Regarding the weather forecasting using, using satellite data, uh, the question that I propose, I use sequences of iMERGE precipitation map. These precipitation map, as I mentioned, are available every 30 minutes with the lag time of four hours. So I use 12 sequences of precipitation map along with uh, atmospheric physical variables, including wind velocity and total precipitable water, feed them to a network and make the network to predict 10 steps ahead. And by 10 steps, since the time step between the precipitation map were 30 minutes, 10 steps stands for five hours. So doing so, we are able to remove the time lat latency that were associated with the original iMERGE data. And to better show the results, here, uh, after training the network, I tested it over uh, uh, 50 hours and compare it with the forecasting of one of the NWP models, GFS. And we can see there is a good agreement, a general agreement between these two data sets. But when we compare uh, each of them with the ground truth observation, we see that our, uh, the accuracy of our, predict, our forecast is better than GFS when the lead time is less than three and a half hours, which was expected because uh, as we know, the numerical weather prediction models does not, do not have good accuracy for short lead time, mainly because of the uh, problem in initialization and also data assimilation. So this shows that there is a potential in using satellite data for, uh, developing a now casting system and also use this uh, now casting uh, network for developing early warning system uh, for flooding. 
with that, I want to thank you all for listening. And I want to thank a uh, committee member for selecting me as, and, as a recipient of this prestigious award and Silverman family for bonding this award and a special thanks to my advisor for all his support throughout these year, two years. Thank you. We have a time for a couple of short questions. Who wants to start first? Well, I have a question myself. Is uh, well, looking at this, of this is fascinating work. And uh, well, one thing I'm sure is uh, your talk <laughs> is much fancier than many years ago <laughs> when uh, your advisors uh, were to receive a talk. <laughs> and uh, yeah, looking at the technology now and with uh, those kind of uh, the re resolution and the data. But meanwhile, with this uh, um, uh, the algorithm you are developing and uh, certainly you know, with the time and the accuracy. So my question is this, um, uh, considering now okay, with the numerical weather forecasting and uh, those products, and uh, it's like, how do they compare okay, with the uh, uh, results you obtain here or from the satellite data? And uh, I'm sure there are work done in this direction, but uh, it's just, uh, I'm curious to know. Is... Okay, so you mean the NWP model? Yes, yeah. Okay. So in the last slide, yeah. in the last slide, I compare my forecast yeah. with the one of the uh, numerical weather forecasting model, the numerical weather prediction model, GFS. Yeah. yeah. So the numeric, the problem with the numerical weather forecasting, numerical weather prediction model is that when we want to forecast for short lead time, uh, the accuracy is not good because of the initialization, uh -huh. the uncertainty uh -huh. initialization, and also data assimilation techniques mm -hmm. that are being yeah. used. So uh, they cannot be used for uh, like uh, developing warning systems. Mm -hmm. So then the main purpose of the network that I develop is to uh, improve the forecasting in those short lead times. Yeah, and we were able to do that for up to three and a half hours. Nice. That's great. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Hima. Yeah. Thanks so much for a really interesting talk. I'm curious about how, how um, hurricanes and other kind of bigger events, how well you can forecast those with the trainings. Do you have, do you have to use a special training set for that or can that so, also work? Yeah. So in the last function that we use, uh, we give like more weights to the uh, extreme events to be able to predict them better. But I need to do more analysis to see how accurate our model work for extreme events. Yeah. But to incorporate the uh, importance of them, we assign more weights in the loss function that we defined for the network. Okay. Well, for the uh, consideration of the time, and we need to move on with the program, but uh, after the event, and then okay, uh, the audience can continue to ask questions informally afterwards. Okay. So next, let me present this uh, award certificate, and I would like to invite the advisor <laughs> come up. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you stand in the middle. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. And uh, yeah, okay. so Lisa Leary is a great honor. Okay. And uh, well, Rihanna, you yourself see it? And yeah, for you your wonderful work. And uh, I have seen uh, Rihanna being in the lab almost every day and studying very hard. And uh, yeah, okay, so, and uh, so this is a certificate. And also along with the certificate, there is a check, and actually a quite a big check. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, thanks a lot for all the people contributed to this uh, Silverman Award. So as a tradition of our Staff for award ceremony.
we always invite a distinguished researcher from outside to give a keynote uh, presentation. Okay. So today, okay, we have the same honor. And the next, I would like to ask Professor Shirfan to come up to introduce our keynote speaker today. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone screwed to this side of the room. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Anna Trugman. Um, I've known Anna for some time, but um, her list of accomplishments and degrees are quite many. Um, so she graduated from Stanford uh, with a degree from the Geological Environmental Science and then PhD at Princeton University in Oceanic and Atmospheric. Okay, <laughs> sciences, and then went on to do um, a USDA postdoc fellowship at the University of Utah. And amongst her many accolades include the Tansley Medal from New Phytologist, the Early Career Award from the Society of, um, the Ecological Society of America, ESA, and then the AGU Early Career Award from the section of um, Global Environmental Change. So I'm gonna leave the platform for Anna and then look forward to your presentation. Bingo. Oh, you're set, okay. Thank you. So is this happening? There. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shui. Um, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today and for taking time out of your schedule to come. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to talk with everyone so far. Um, so I'm Anna Trugman. I'm an assistant professor in the geography department at UCSD. And today I hope to convince you that plant functional traits are really important and useful to consider even when you're caring about terrestrial um, hydrological and carbon cycles. And before I get started, I just want to take the chance to um, thank my funding sources, my lab group, as well as my collaborators that have been really integral in this work. And in particular, I'm going to highlight a number of pieces that my postdoc, Greg Queeton, has um, worked on over the past few years in my lab. And I want to start out by giving you a brief roadmap of where I'm going to go today. I'm going to talk about a lot of the motivation for my research, namely forests in a water limited world. Um, and then I'm going to provide some motivation and context for why plants are so interesting and cool and talk about the power of plant sap ascent in the hydrological cycle. Um, then I'm going to transition and talk about how plant traits and trait diversity, which manifests as species diversity, mediate water and carbon fluxes. And I'm going to wrap up um, with more of a plant centric view thinking about hopefully having persuaded you that they're important in a um, earth system contest thinking context, thinking about how changes in water availability may affect our forests. Um, so forests are this amazing resource. They host the vast majority of this planet's biodiversity. They also modulate surface energy fluxes, the hydrological cycle, and the terrestrial carbon cycle. And I'm gonna focus particularly on the hydrological cycle and terrestrial carbon cycle today. And from a climate change perspective, forests are really important because there's this critical carbon sink. So this is a picture of the global carbon cycle over time. And on the positive part of the axes, we have net emissions due to fossil fuel burning and land use change. And these emissions can go into three main pools in the earth system. They can go into the ocean. Um, and if you look, the amount going into the ocean is increasing as our emissions are increasing, but it doesn't vary a lot on short time scales. These emissions can go into the atmosphere. And this is what I think of when I think of anthropogenic climate change is rapidly rising atmospheric CO2. But if you actually look at the amount going into the atmosphere from year to year, it's highly variable. And the reason it's so variable um, is because of terrestrial ecosystems and plants. Um, so currently terrestrial ecosystems take up about 30% of anthropogenic emissions, and the vast majority of this is in forested ecosystems. So they're doing us this huge service in terms of mitigating climate change. Um, but the amount year to year sequestered in the um, terrestrial carbon sink is highly variable. 
And that's because these terrestrial ecosystems are really sensitive to changes in climate and water availability. And so that makes it really uncertain um, knowing how they may respond to future anthropogenic climate change that may modify hydrological cycles. And um, it's also uncertain because they're competing mechanisms. So on the one hand, um, higher atmospheric CO2 increases productivity and actually increases plant water use efficiency um, because uh, plants have to open pores in their leaves or stomates to allow CO2 to diffuse in. And when they do that, um, they actually lose water. And so with a higher um, concentration gradient between the atmosphere and the interstitial, what's called the interstitial CO2, plants don't lose as much water because they can um, open their stomates less to gain the same amount of carbon. And this is um, a figure kind of illustrating this concept by Smith et al. And this shows um, different um, simulations from the coupled model intercomparison project phase five. Um, one where they, they have just the radiative effect of CO2 on climate, but not the physiological effect um, that benefits plants. And that's what's shown um, with this brown line. And you can see that um, each of these uh, lighter colored lines represents a different model and the dark, darker lines represent the multi-model mean. You can see there's a slight decline in net primary productivity, which is carbon assimilation um, in 2100 compared to historical times with just this climate effect. But when you add this physiological benefit of CO2, um, you get a potential strong boost in productivity. But on the other hand, um, with higher CO2, you increase temperature and you can increase um, drought, fire, and insect-driven die-off. Um, and a lot of these mechanisms aren't actually incorporated in the coupled climate or system models that we're using to make that forecast, which predicts increases in productivity. And um, drought and heat-induced mortality has actually already been observed to be a global problem. This is a map of major drought and heat-induced mortality events around the globe over um, the past 50 years. And what's really important is each one of these mortality events has the potential to release a large amount of carbon back into the atmosphere and cause a positive feedback on climate change. And so really understanding where and when you expect um, this productivity increase associated with the physiological benefit of CO2 or some sort of disturbance-driven mortality is really of critical importance for understanding um, net emissions trajectories that we need to mitigate climate change. Um, and there's actually potential for this, these different mortality processes to get substantially worse because um, with climate change, we expect changes in precipitation, but also as you warm the atmosphere, you increase the amount of moisture the atmosphere can hold. And this increases what's called vapor pressure deficit, which puts um, additional stress on trees um, independent of changes in precipitation. And just from an earth system perspective, water availability really strongly influences the land carbon sink. So this is a really nice study done by Vincent Humphrey and colleagues um, published in Nature in 2019. And what they showed was that um, they looked at the detrended atmospheric CO2 growth rate, which is on the left-hand side of this y-axis here in black. And note, it increases as you decrease along the y-axis. And they compared it to terrestrial water storage as measured from the GRACE satellite. And this is on the right-hand side of the y-axis and um, terrestrial water storage increases um, as you increase along the y-axis in blue. And what they found is um, years of anomalously high atmospheric CO2 growth rates, you had anomalously low um, water, terrestrial water storage. And the converse was true as well when you had anomalously low atmospheric CO2 growth rates, there was more water um, in terrestrial systems, really showing how this land carbon sink interacts with water availability and impacts atmospheric CO2 levels. And now I wanna talk about what's going on from the plant side when we're um, dealing with changes in water availability. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about plant hydraulic traits because they're really important in affecting um, productivity and the movement of water between the land surface and the atmosphere. And so just briefly, water travels along a water potential gradient from the soil through the plant and into the leaves and then is transpired into the atmosphere and changes in either for example, decreases in soil water potential 
or increases in atmospheric vapor pressure deficit can both um, put additional stress on the internal plant organs and affect um, the xylem sap pressure. And what happens when you um, increase might you um, increase the tension on the xylem and make the xylem sap pressure increasingly negative is the plant loses conductivity. And this is what's shown here is um, xylem sap pressure where you get increasingly negative as you increase along the x-axis and um, percent loss in um, plant hydraulic conductance or conductivity along the y-axis here. And so you can see um, as, as the xylem sap pressure gets much more negative, the plant is actually failing to move water um, through its stem conductance. And there are potentially lethal levels of um, percent losses in conductivity um, from which a plant can't recover. So um, this has important implications both for water transport and also for the hydraulic integrity and um, life of the plant. And so now I want to um, just contextualize some of this work by talking about the power of plant sap ascent in the hydrological cycle. And, um, and what's really key and interesting is that transpiration drives a pump that um, is required to overcome resistance in plants to power sap ascent, much like um, a pump flow through a pipe. And um, my postdoc, Greg Queeton, actually set out to quantify um, just how much um, power these plants were harnessing um, through this passive transpiration um, mechanism that, that actually doesn't require any energy to circulate the water um, through the plant hydraulic system using um, measurements of stem conductivity, um, satellite remote sensing measurements of leaf area index and transpiration, as well as tree height. Um, and what was actually a really cool result that we found is that the power density used to both lift this water and overcome resistance in the stem, um, uh, this hydraulic resistance that uh, actually confers um, either drought resistance or drought vulnerability, um, depending on which species, um, is actually comparable to some feats of human industrial engineering. And so just um, for context of the power density required in terms of overcoming this gravitational force and the resistance in the stem. Um, Greg looked at it across um, all global ecosystems, um, uh, including forested and non-forested systems. And, and that's what's shown um, with this red box right here. And just note that the scale is logged on the, um, on the x-axis here. And so this total sap ascent power um, density is, is actually much lower than if we're thinking on like the global hydrological cycle in terms of latent heat fluxes, but um, it is actually comparable um, to, for example, the total production of hydropower across the globe, which was about 10.5 petawatt hours in 2019, and this global sap percent is around 9.4 petawatt hours per year. But what's important from the plant's perspective is that this is um, completely passive harvesting of energy. And it, it's um, uh, about 15% of, um, if you're looking at the total power density from gross primary productivity that plants are um, uh, you know, actively assimilating carbon, it's about 15% um, of that. So they're gaining about 15% um, free energy for some sort of circulatory process that um, human metabolic systems like uh, invest a significant amount of uh, energy to produce. And actually the ratio of um, power density from sap ascent to um, the power density from photosynthesis varies across the globe due to both plant traits and climate. So it scales both with transpiration squared and also resistance, which is one over the conduct conductivity or conductance of the stem, depending on how you're normalizing it. And so um, areas where you have this kind of larger amount of free energy that this plant is harvesting include um, areas where there's a lot of transpiration like the Amazonian rainforest. And also um, regions where, I think maybe the clicker's dead. Um, Or did it get turned off? No. Uh, I cycled it, I think. Nope. 
Ah, great. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and also regions. So, um, so uh, the um, SAP ascent scales with um, transpiration squared. So regions where you have a lot of transpiration, like the Amazonian rainforest, um, uh, have a, a like higher ratio of this free um, SAP ascent power relative to the amount of or the power density from gross primary productivity, which is just a carbon assimilated through photosynthesis. Um, but also regions where there are plant stems with a larger resistance have a higher ratio. And that includes a lot of conifer forests like the Pacific Northwest, um, where you also have high transpiration values in this case. So um, both um, plant functional traits and climate um, influence this uh, like, the amount of extra energy plants are potentially leveraging um, to perform their physiological function. Um, so now I want to transition and talk about we've I've provided some basics in terms of plant traits. Mainly, I focused on um, conductivity in plants, um, and that actually we're going to see in a little bit um, has a lot to do with how drought resistant or drought vulnerable different plants are. But I want to focus on how not only these trait values, but trait diversity, how important they are in terms of mediating water and carbon fluxes, and then how they factor into forest resilience to um, changes in climate stress. Um, so I already talked about this percent loss and conductivity curve where um, as you uh, increase the tension in a plant stem, it loses conductivity. Um, it actually turns out that different plants are more resistant or more vulnerable to hydraulic stress. And so this shows two different plant species, a pinion and a juniper, and their um, percent loss and conductivity curve. And you can see for the exact same xylem sap pressure, you might have very different percent losses in conductivity um, depending on how your stem is engineered. And so a juniper can function quite normally at um, minus four megapascal tension in its stem, whereas um, a, a pinion might lose a substantial amount of conductivity at that same um, xylem sap pressure. And so a pinion in this case is much more vulnerable to um, increased water stress or decreased water availability than um, a juniper. And there's actually um, plant physiologists um, have picked out a particular plant functional trait that they use to describe the um, resistance of a stem to water stress. Um, it's called P50 or um, the pressure at which 50% conductivity is lost. And you can see this is gonna happen at around minus nine megapascals for juniper and maybe uh, minus 3.5 for pinion. Um, so there's a pretty wide range of um, water stress that they're able to deal with. Um, so in this portion um, and in this particular study, I along with some co-authors wanted to know, can plant trait diversity in forests directly affect land atmosphere interactions by mediating and buffering um, the responses of latent heat fluxes to changes in water availability. And um, to, to really approach this question, we did it um, using eddy covariance data. We used 350 site years of eddy covariance data from 40 temperate and boreal um, forest sites across the globe. Um, these are the sites shown here um, where larger circles rec um, represent more site years. And um, the color legend ac actually represents overall species diversity um, across the globe. So you can see locations like the Amazon have a really high level of species diversity. And the reason we um, screened down to these 40 different sites um, was because we needed sites that had soil moisture data, um, vapor pressure deficit data, temperature, um, photosynthetically active radiation, and we needed species inventories at these sites so that we could map species to plant functional traits. Um, we use the climate data like soil moisture and vapor pressure deficit in particular to observe the sensitivity of latent heat fluxes to um, soil moisture, vapor pressure deficit, and their interaction. Um, 
we use some data sets of plant functional traits, um, particularly hydraulic traits like stem conductivity and P50, as well as some other traits and photosynthetic traits um, to look at the relative importance of these different functional traits and explaining the sensitivity of latent heat fluxes to periods of dry down. Um, and then we used um, a series of statistical models to test which site level factors and plant traits were most associated with ecosystem flux variation in response to drought and whether uh, diversity in traits stabilized fluctuations during drought period. So did you see a substantial drop in latent heat flux during a drought relative to a non-drought period when other factors like photosynthetically active radiation were not limiting? Um, and um, we actually found that a diversity in hydraulic traits, particularly hydraulic safety margin, um, uh, was really important in terms of buffering latent heat fluxes during drought periods. And hydraulic safety margin um, is a derivative of this P50 trait that I just talked about. Um, and what's actually really cool is that um, we found that the drought sensitivity actually decreased substantially um, as um, hydraulic trait diversity increased. And so that's what's shown in this figure here, where as you um, increase along the y-axis, you have more um, a higher sensitivity, so a larger dip in latent heat fluxes during drought periods. Um, and as you increase along the x-axis here, um, you increase in hydraulic trait diversity. And each of these different points represents a different um, eddy covariance site. Um, red is uh, evergreen needle leaf, uh, and uh, green is deciduous broadleaf trees. And so um, I hope I've convinced you now that um, plant functional traits are important, even when you care about um, uh, much more of an atmospheric or a hydrological perspective. Uh, and now I want to shift and take a more forest ecologically oriented perspective and um, talk about how changes in water availability may change forests um, under potential future climate regimes. And I want to start back here with this um, P50 trait uh, because it um, this difference in drought tolerance or drought resistance is really important to the story of what um, plants can do to um, adapt or resist climate change in terms of maintaining forest presence. Um, and so we have this much more um, vulnerable pinion tree here and more drought resistant um, juniper tree. And um, one way that you could imagine forests adapting or resisting climate change is by shifting in species composition towards, uh, if you have two different species um, with um, different drought tolerant or drought avoidance strategies in a particular forest plot, you could imagine a change in species composition, um, maintaining forested area with changes in climate. Um, uh, and so we wanted to look to see to what extent um, current trait reservoirs at particular locations could um, buffer against climate change. And so to do that, what we um, did first was we developed maps of community weighted hydraulic traits and trait diversity across the US. This is a map of this P50 trait that I mentioned. Um, and what we did was we used forest inventory data that has um, high resolution species diversity and abundance um, uh, across the US that's remeasured at um, set intervals of either five or 10 years, depending on if you're in the Western or Eastern US um, since the year 2000. And we used um, a hydraulic trait and um, photosynthetic trait database to map um, uh, species uh, ID to um, different plant hydraulic traits that represent how resistant or um, vulnerable plants are to drought. Um, this is a map of uh, the community weighted traits, which we weighted by total basal area within that forest plot. And just um, to uh, orient you, um, I'll just switch to the computer maybe. Uh, yeah, so just to orient you, um, yellower values or less negative values are um, for uh, 
plants or communities that are comprised of majority uh, more drought vulnerable species and more negative values are um, forests comprised of species that are um, have more drought resistant traits. And this map makes a lot of sense if you're familiar with the climate of the US. You can see in the Eastern United States um, where there's a lot more water um, and the main limiting resource that plants are coping with is not water. Uh, you don't have as, um, uh, you have species that are more vulnerable to water stress. And um, as you look at the Western United States where water availability is much more limited, you have um, communities that are comprised of species that are much more drought resistant. Um, and actually from these maps, we weren't, uh, we not only extracted these community weighted means, but we were able to look at um, the within plot diversity in terms of the most drought vulnerable trees and the most drought resistant trees, as well as within a climate grid cell, which in, in this experiment that we were doing um, was a quarter degree. And so we looked at um, what potential uh, trait compositions we had within that climate grid cell with the idea that um, within a forest plot, you could get shifts in species abundance. And then over time within a particular climate grid cell, you might get seeding in of proximal species that could um, uh, sustain a forest um, if given long enough to, um, and if their traits were um, able to compensate for any potential increases in climate stress. Um, and we not only wanted to look at uh, how changes in species composition might buffer climate stress, but um, there's also potential for within species um, acclimation in different traits to compensate for stress. And one major lever that plants have is adjusting their leaf area um, because leaf area, um, it represents the water demand of the plant. Plants are losing um, water, um, which scales with all of the stomates integrated across their canopy. Um, and the supply pipe, you can consider their sapwood area or basically the cross-sectional area of their stem. And there's actually been a number of observations um, just looking at exactly at this, at how leaf area to sapwood area adjusts depending on climate dryness. And if you look at this left-hand panel right here, um, AL to AS represents uh, leaf area to sapwood area at kind of a branch level. Um, physiologists will go and just cut off branches, measure the cross-sectional sapwood area. You can scan all the leaves and do a really rigorous job of quantifying this ratio. Um, and as climate dryness increases, this ratio um, or the leaf area relative to sapwood area decreases. So plants actively adjust within the same species, in this case, Scott's pine. Um, and then if you look at the right-hand panel here, um, this is a separate study. Um, HV stands for Huber value, which is actually just one over um, AL to AS. So it's the inverse. Um, and this was a study in Australia looking at a number of different eucalyptus and acacia species. And you can see where um, uh, precipitation exceeds evapotranspiration um, or potential evapotranspiration you get a higher leaf area to sapwood area. Um, and so, and in both cases, um, drier locations equal lower leaf area to sapwood area, even within the same species. And what's um, another key and useful factor is you can use um, a, a plant physiological model that is based on carbon maximization principles to predict this downregulation in um, uh, leaf area to sapwood area. Um, and so right here, I, I show the different observational data points and you can see the model predictions um, as you increase vapor pressure deficit, uh, how this leaf area to sapwood ratio should change if you're trying to maximize plant carbon gain. Um, so in this particular portion, we wanted to focus on and ask, how do plant hydraulic traits and trait diversity mediate plant water status and stress across the climate gradient of the continental United States? Are there key regions that may become more or less vulnerable to drought stress with climate change? And to what extent can current forest trait reservoirs buffer future increases in water stress? And this work was led um, by my postdoc, Greg Cleeton, who's currently under review. Um, so to answer these questions, we use these hydraulic trait maps that I mentioned, combined with um, 
a plant physiological model, which is an optimi optimization-based tree model that includes a realistic representation of gas exchange um, at the leaf level. And so this is um, CO2 diffusing in, water diffusing out. Uh, a detailed representation of the plant hydraulic processes. So um, these uh, different resistors running through the um, plant roots, uh, stem and leaves. Um, and in the model, photosynthesis is a function of these plant physiological traits that I mentioned, as well as climate. And so um, you can get changes in productivity, depending on if you're in wetter or drier areas, if temperature changes, and also depending on your plant physiology, like your hydraulic traits. Um, and this model predicts how environmental conditions impact plant hydraulic function and carbon gain. Um, it's run at a daily time step. And the meteorological forcings include um, photosynthetically active radiation, temperature, uh, root zone soil water potential, atmospheric vapor pressure deficit, and atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And outputs include a number of useful diagnostics that tell you about plant function, including transpiration, net carbon assimilation, um, plant water potentials, which measure um, water status or how dehydrated the leaves are. Um, and um, percent loss in hydraulic conductivity, which is that curve that I just, um, that I've been uh, coming back to. And, and that's a metric of hydraulic stress. And um, above certain thresholds in that loss in conductivity, trees tend to die if they've experienced those lethal levels of stress. Um, and this model has been validated against a number of different observations, including leaf area to sapwood area predictions, carbon use efficiency, which is just the amount of carbon assimilated versus loss to respiration, um, evapotranspiration, and gross primary productivity. I'm not going to get into those here, but I'm happy to chat about that with anyone who's interested. Um, and so the experiments. Uh, we designed a number of experiments to look at how traits mediate climate stress and how stress might change under climate. And so um, we parameterized this plant hydraulic model with uh, um, hydraulic trait maps and trait diversity derived from um, the U.S. Forest Inventory Plot Network. And we ran factorial experiments where we looked at community weighted mean um, traits and how that impacted um, predictions of stress and water status, as well as the extremes. So within grid cell extremes and within plot extremes. Um, and then we also looked at how these adjustments in leaf area and particularly um, leaf area optimized to both historical and future climates um, could impact and mediate stress. Um, and then um, to look at these um, historical and future climate scenarios, um, we ran 20-year uh, simulations at a daily time step um, from using historical data, 1995 to 2014, and future data um, from the coupled model intercomparison project phase six um, along SSP um, 3-7, which is an intermediate um, climate change scenario. Um, for growing season climate. And this was done for the period of 2080 to 2100. These are just some example maps of averaged forcing data. Um, and then we also did scenarios with and without adaptive leaf acclimation to the future climate scenarios to look at how this um, leaf functional trait could mediate stress. Um, and so, um, as is the theme of some of the other things I mentioned, both climate and hydraulic traits were important in mediating patterns of water status and water stress. And so this is a map of plant water status as um, measured through leaf water potential across the continental US where more negative values indicate um, a decreased water in the leaf relative to less negative values, which are more purple. Um, and this, um, uh, Leaf water potential is a function of um, uh, basically how low a plant is willing to let its water potential go based on these those um, hydraulic uh, vulnerability curves, and um, and also how dry a particular location is. And actually, this water status doesn't correspond one to one with water stress. Oh, I should back up. So you can see it um, as makes a lot of sense based on the climate of the. US that um, 
Uh, wetter locations like the eastern United States have more hydrated leaves compared to these drier locations in the western United States where the water potentials are more negative. Um, but this actually, water potential doesn't correspond one to one with um, hydraulic stress or the percent loss in conductivity because if you recall that juniper tree can um, withstand a lot more negative water potentials before losing any sort of conductivity um, in its stem compared to the pinion tree. And so um, here, um, le higher levels, uh, you can see that on the east coast of the United States where there's more water, um, and even though the leaves are a bit more hydrated, in some cases, a lot of those plants can't, um, are a little bit more stressed than their Western counterparts just because they aren't as drought resistant um, compared to this Western United States where you can see the leaf water potential is much more negative, but, um, these plants are more able to cope with water stress. And um, uh, actually, um, if you look at how trait diversity mediates these patterns of water stress, like within a site or within a climate grid cell, um, and draw your attention to the extremes, so the uh, most vulnerable trees within a particular climate grid cell, um, in a lot of cases, spend a lot of time with large losses in conductivity. And just for reference, if you're a plant functioning in the world, um, you probably want to function within the um, losing less than 10% of your conductivity on a regular basis. And so um, this indicates that uh, plants that um, have potentially more of a drought avoidance strategy um, uh, across the United States are a lot more vulnerable to changes in climate stress and even current day hydraulic stress um, compared to uh, the um, least vulnerable trees within a particular climate grid cell um, where they're functioning in a, a pretty um, standard range that, that wouldn't compromise plant hydraulic function. Um, and so we came up with a metric of um, called stressed seasons to kind of map different patterns of water stress across the US. And um, uh, we used a threshold of 50% loss in conductivity. And if during a 20 year simulation, um, the plant in that particular grid cell crossed that um, threshold of 50% of loss in conductivity, then it received a, a tick mark and you could receive up to um, 20 tick marks because we ran a 20 year simulation. And so any point on this map that has um, uh, any color in it other than gray had at least one stressed season. Um, and you can see large areas in the mountain west of the United States that um, have uh, uh, at least one stressed season where we've already been seeing a fair amount of drought induced mortality. There's um, a pattern in the central US where um, where there's actually um, a number of stress seasons. And um, we, we think that that might be due to um, like uh, riparian hab corridors in that location where our climate um, soil moisture forcing doesn't uh, quite match what the plants are actually seeing in those locations. And then a little bit less mortality, or sorry, stress seasons in the Eastern United States. And we we're actually able to compare that to mortality in um, documented in the forest inventory. And this is just summarized um, in uh, Western and Eastern United States where um, this zero here indicates that um, the model found zero stress seasons. And so the background mortality in those particular grid cells was significantly lower than um, any place where the model recorded um, stressed seasons over that 20 year period. Um, but um, uh, we didn't find any increase in um, mortality in locations that had one or more stress seasons. They were, they were roughly all the same in terms of looking at the mortality data. Um, and what we found under future climate scenarios was that um, climate change uh, really increased systematic stress in the majority of US locations. And so this is a map of um, the change in plant water status. So this isn't stress, but change in water potential um, between the um, average over the future minus historical simulations. And here, um, more negative values correspond to um, declines in uh, plant water potential. 
And then um, this is a change in the percent loss in conductivity um, where um, you have uh, more stressed uh, in redder colors and less stressed in um, bluer colors. Um, so blue indicates a decrease in um, conductivity loss. And, um, and this represents uh, daily changes in percent loss in conductivity. And so the majority of locations across the US um, experience increases in conductivity loss, um, particularly in the mountain west and south. There is this interesting pattern in the eastern United States where um, the model, um, this, this was a scenario where we had dynamic leaf area and the model decreased um, leaf area uh, due to respiratory costs increasing in response to temperature more rapidly than um, photosynthetic carbon assimilation. And so that had like um, a uh, added benefit that it decreased hydraulic stress. So um, if you're a plant physiologist, which there are luckily very few in the room, you probably would um, be somewhat critical that the, the um, a few percentages is not really measurable in terms of um, the precision of these measurements, these plant hydraulic measurements. Um, but uh, I guess what we'd like to stress is that um, this is um, an increase in daily stress. It's not an increase in, of one to 2% during a drought period. And um, if you think about a plant stem, it's subject to the same mechanical weathering that any other type of infrastructure is. Um, and in particular, um, several increases, percent increases in stress um, you know, can really increase uh, things like cavitation fatigue, which is a process that goes on in plant stems where you get air seeding laterally that can block different xylem vessels. And, and so you could imagine um, this really putting an extra carbon tax in terms of repair or turnover in the stem. Um, and so next we wanted to ask, we have all of these different possible traits we can swap in and out in a given grid cell to see how resistant a plant can be to this increased stress. So we wanted to see, were there any traits in our grab bag within this grid cell that we could use that would um, keep stress the same as historical levels or decrease it in terms of uh, losing plant conductivity? And so um, this figure is a little complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it piece by piece. Um, but uh, these pie charts represent the fraction of grid cells in each category. Um, and the color legend indicates where um, which set of traits allowed us to um, keep climate stress constant relative to historic levels or decrease it. Um, and gray colors indicate that no tree was able to cope with the increase in climate stress. So none of the traits were um, sufficient to mitigate these increases in stress. Um, pink colors indicate that all trees within that particular grid cell were able to cope with that climate stress. And um, you'll notice the vast majority of locations and climate grid cells that where we ran this um, uh, required at least some sort of shift in hydraulic traits um, to, uh, or shift in forest composition to maintain uh, levels of stress that we saw in the historical simulations. Um, and then we actually wanted to compare this to observations. Um, in particular, these uh, forest inventory observations don't only provide us um, maps of species distribution and abundance that we can match to traits, but they show us changes over time, over about two decades, because this inventory um, was run systematically starting in the year 2000. And we have return measurements every 10 years in the Western United States and every five years in the Eastern United States. And so you can actually calculate how the um, composition is changing from a trait velocity perspective over time um, and compare it to what we found was like required based on our um, model predictions. And so um, this is the probability distribution of these trait velocities across the US um, where shifts towards more negative values um, indicate shifts towards more drought hardy forests. Um, and we have uh, forest inventory uh, documented shifts in black 
Um, and we actually did find a decrease or um, a shift towards slightly more drought hardy forests, but it was an order of magnitude less than what our model predictions indicated. We need to um, keep climate stress constant in the um, uh, 2081 to uh, 2100 period. So um, it, it appears that both um, uh, like potential acclimation in leaf area and traits are sufficient to buffer climate stress in a number of locations, but we're not seeing shifts um, fast enough to keep up with the pace required according to our predictions. Um, so just to summarize, um, I talked about that both climate and hydraulic traits mediate patterns of current water status and water stress across the US. Um, climate change has the potential to increase stress, modifying global hydrological and carbon cycles. Uh, many forests may require at least some shift in species composition to mediate climate stress. Hydraulic trait diversity and species acclimation have potential to protect ecosystems um, in some locations, but current changes in composition are not keeping pace with required turnover to mitigate climate stress. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, okay. Um, does anyone, okay. Um, a while ago, about halfway through your talk, you had a graph that showed it kind of an inverse relationship between uh, trait diversity and something like um, drought sensitivity. Yeah. And Do you want me to go back to that? Or? Yeah, if, if, I mean, it depends how much trouble that is, but because okay. I can't remember quite the vertical axis. It was something. Um, yeah, it, it, the vertical axis was drought sensitivity. Which okay, so it was, vague. it was just that. I was, so yeah, as long as you get there. Yeah, that. Right at zero um, trait uh, um, diversity, you have a huge range of points. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious about the ones in the lower left. So do they have a different strategy for being drought hardy? I mean, they're clearly doing you know, okay without any trait diversity. Yeah, and um, so that's a great question. And I would say, you know, this this spread here, so this is a significant relationship, but this spread here um, actually probably has to do with the difficulty of separating out. And, and you know, uh, Brendan might even be able to speak to this a little better, but you want um, to look at this experiment, you want to look at um, uh, specifically plants uh, responding in somewhat of a water limited environment. Um, and so we did do a screening to make sure that um, to that um, water was at least potentially a limiting factor by making sure that vapor pressure deficit was above um, half a megapascal. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I think some of this spread could be due not only to species diversity, but other environmental conditions that might be, or other limiting resources that might be regulating function as well. And so I think like a potentially more careful screening could bring up a stronger relationship. So you just think it's kind of a, a, a basically a spread of a, I mean, kind of an error or a, it doesn't really signify. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the right. system. So I, I just, um, uh, yeah, I think there could be a number of processes that it could be attributable to, but that's a great question. Yeah, I was just wondering if no, certain yeah. plant groups have adopted a different path to survive drought. And and this was actually, um, you know, that could still be true. This was um, uh, the hydraulic trait that we were particularly looking at was hydraulic safety margin, which is um, kind of a derivative of P50, which I've been talking about a lot. And um, you could imagine other functional traits or other axes could help explain more of this variation. Um, great question though. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, just a general question about the uh, the power study. 
So is the power coming from the air then because the air is what's kind of causing the gradient, the pull? Um, not really. It, I think it's actually coming from the like the input energy, basically. So radiation is um, and, and so like, I mean, the, the driving force is transpiration and then you have um, like water moving through these pipes due to capillary action and hydrogen bonds and you get evaporation at the, all of these tiny menisci um, across the leaf. And so it's really that that pull from transpiration that is overcoming the gravitational force and the resistance in the plant stem. We were actually a little surprised that the resistance ended up being a, a much larger portion of that than the gravitational component. But. Okay. But it would technically be the air because the pull is driven by the gradient in vapor. Because the Yeah, but would you, I guess, this, but that evaporation is driven by the incoming radiation. Yeah. I guess, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was curious of where the, the free energy is coming from. There's got to be obviously a source. Yeah, the, no, it, I think yeah. the ultimate source is the incoming solar okay. radiation, but not the, um, uh, obviously not the component that's powering photosynthesis. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Um, thank you for the talk. I, I was wondering with the leaf area acclimation, what time scale are we looking at? Is it a lifetime of the tree or is it like longer that's evolutionary? A good and I think the, um, uh, uh exactly how rapidly um plants can um like plastically adjust their leaves really ranges um depending on species um so the studies i was show that i showed um for um contextualization of this acclimation process was it was they were actually spatial studies so it was within the same species but across space um, you could consider, um, like, if you're thinking on a, a time scale, the extreme of drought deciduous forests, where they actively adjust their leaves to avoid the dry season um, on the order of months. Um, not most of the forests in, like, the temperate U.S. are not drought deciduous, um, or even most of the forests on the globe. Um, and but there is evidence for like leaf shedding or leaf adjustment over time, even in trees that aren't fully drought deciduous. In our model, the way we represented it was we optimized um, leaf area to maximize carbon gain over the entire historical climatology or the entire future climatology. So it was over a 20 year simulation. Um, and you could imagine, depending on what species it is, it's probably somewhere in between that extreme seasonal cycle versus some sort of multi-year climate history acclimation. Um, yeah, great question. Oh, do you have a question? No, I'm okay. I have a question. Um, I thought it was really striking that the map that you showed for stress basically had a band running down the center of US, right? And I was kind of honing into the state of Minnesota because we're all familiar with the layout of Minnesota. And that map um, does cover a transition zone between temperate hardwood forests to the western part of the state, which is more um, grassland-like and potentially be, been kind of underlaid with different kind of geology. Um, so do you have a like an intuition for what explains that band. Yeah, I was actually wondering um, if it was, so um, that particular pattern, I agree is a little strange. And I, so I, I wonder if it's some sort of riparian areas that are being picked up in the forest inventory mm -hmm. or um, that, uh, that like inner climate product, um, climate forcing product, which is at a quarter of degree for soil moisture. Um, is not representative of what those trees are seeing in that particular location. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you, if it was a riparian area, you'd expect some really um, drought vulnerable hydraulic traits, but mm -hmm. our climate grid cell is mainly just representing a pretty arid region that usually supports grassland. And so those trees in the inventory that are, are really only there because of like some mm -hmm. sort of riparian area um, are the model is accurately predicting if they didn't have some subsurface subsidy that they probably mm -hmm. would be dead 
Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a great question and we're looking into that a little more. So. Thanks. Oh, another one. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, kind of looking at this plot again and off one of the earlier questions, um, I was thinking about kind of in addition to hydraulic trait diversity, if there's potentially a role you think for kind of like landscape or hydrological diversity, even within kind of a single climate zone. Um, and if that was maybe something you looked at at all with this data or may have been captured in the sites. That is a great question. Um, and probably, not as common at like the different eddy covariance sites with in terms of landscape diversity, just because you usually like them on flatter terrain. Um, uh, but um, I absolutely think that like hydraulic or like subcritical zone diversity or subsurface water diversity is is like a very important angle um, beyond physiology that uh, you know. Um, a lot of dynamic vegetation models um, where like the vegetation is is an emergent property on on the landscape based on the climate forcing and and some sort of seeding in uh, really have trouble predicting um, vegetation populations persisting in in like drier locations, for example. And I think um, the uh, factor that is really um, like causing an issue or a mismatch between model predictions and the observations is the hydraulic or subsurface hydrology diversity. Great, thank you. Okay, well, questions online? No, okay, well, um, oh, Hima? Uh, yeah. okay. I, I noticed that in the, um, in the future prediction models that the Gulf Coast was really a drought, what was it? Yeah, it was red. So it looked yeah. like there was a like large- what, What's in, going yeah. on there? Uh, I think it's just uh, um, probably vapor pressure deficit effects. Um, so um, uh, on, on like plant stress. So as you warm the atmosphere, you're really um, increasing um, the vapor pressure deficit. Uh, because you increase the amount of moisture the atmosphere can hold. And I, so I think it's it's driven predominantly by that. Yeah, it's really interesting that it's like a certain distance from the like. Yeah, and there, there are multiple things you wanna pay attention to. There's the change and then there's like the absolute PLC relative to the change. And so if it's, it's um, so this was, it was absolute percentage. So it wasn't normalized by what the previous PLC was, um, but, uh, it still might be a bit lower in in those locations because it tends to be pretty humid. So I, I suspect the vapor pressure was, and the PLC um, in his, the historical simulations was relatively low, but it, it did increase um, uh, at a, a more rapid rate than other locations. Great question. All right, let's thank Anna one last time um, for a great talk. And then I know she'll be, um, around afterwards to answer more questions if you have any. Thank you.